a massive fire broke out at the Moss Landing battery energy storage system. And the fallout, it's not looking good. Residents are furious. People are reporting breathing and digestive issues, and some still can't return to their homes. And now, reports are confirming contamination in the surrounding area. This isn't just another battery fire. This could have long-term consequences for the entire community. It's been about a month since the massive fire at Moss Landing, where an estimated 80% of a big energy storage system burned. They stored right around 1,200 megawatt hours worth of power. Shortly afterwards, independent scientists from local communities started collecting samples to determine just how bad the contamination was. Now, there are three things I like raw, photography and data. Stick around because I'll be going over the available data, how it was collected, and its limitations. Just to be clear, I'm not here to draw conclusions, just to present what's been gathered so far. Transparency is key in situations like this. When a disaster happens, misinformation spreads quickly, and it's important to look at the actual data rather than speculation. What you take away from it, that's up to you. The Monterey County Health Department released a preliminary soil screening data summary following the Moss Landing fire. The initial assessment, conducted eight days after the fire, utilized X-ray fluorescence spectrometry, XRF, to scan exposed surface soils in areas that are frequented by the public, such as pathways. The primary focus was on detecting heavy metals commonly associated with lithium-ion battery combustion, including cobalt, manganese, nickel, and copper. It's important to note that these XRF scans provide quick, on-site screenings but are not comprehensive. They evaluate specific surface points and may not reflect on broader soil conditions. For more definitive analysis, soil samples have been collected and submitted to state-certified laboratories, and the results are pending. In addition to soil assessments, drinking water samples were collected from five local water systems that have been tested for manganese, copper, aluminum, and nickel. All these levels were within regulatory standards and consistent with historical data. However, analysis for cobalt, lithium, asbestos, and VOCs, that's still underway. The health department emphasizes that these findings are preliminary and advises the public to wait final, validated results before drawing their own conclusions. The EPA arrived on scene the day after the fire started and began air monitoring for about four days. Their focus was on two key things, hydrogen fluoride, HF, and airborne particle counts. Now, it's not surprising that they didn't detect any HF. Hydrogen fluoride is highly reactive, meaning it doesn't linger in the air for very long. It bonds with other elements and dissipates quickly. So while HF can be a dangerous byproduct of battery fires, it's not something I'd expect to see in the air days later in routine air monitoring. But what about the particulates? The EPA measured particle counts in the air, which should, in theory, pick up things like heavy metals released during the fire. But here's the real question. Are we looking at the right stuff? When you do air monitoring, you have to know exactly what you're looking for. You can't just cast a wide net and test for everything. It doesn't work that way. The instruments are set up to detect specific compounds or certain particle sizes. But what if the most concerning contaminants are escaping in forms we're not even measuring? If the particles getting released are smaller than what's being captured or what's being measured, then we're missing a key part of the picture. Are we testing the right size range? Are we focused on the right chemicals? These are the kinds of questions that need to be asked, and we need to evaluate these air monitoring methods. Because if we're not looking in the right places, we might not be getting the answers we need. In addition to the EPA's air monitoring, Vistra conducted its own air testing through CTEH from January 17th to January 22nd. They focused on HF gas, hydrogen chloride, carbon monoxide, hydrogen cyanide, and fine particulate matter. So what did they find? Really, nothing, at least nothing that set off any alarms. The only thing that showed up was fine particulate matter, all ranging at very small levels. And that puts it in the good to moderate range in the EPA's air quality index. In other words, based on their measurements, there's nothing to worry about. But I go back to, are we even looking for the right things? We know that lithium ion battery fighters release a lot more than HF and CO. What about the VOCs? What about heavy metals? Looking at the particulate does tell us that there is fine particulate in the air, but what is in those particles? Were they carrying toxic byproducts from the fire? Or is it just stuff that's typically always floating around in the air? Researchers from Moss Landing's marine laboratories recently detected nickel, cobalt, and manganese in the wetlands near the battery fire site. 
and the levels they measured were 100 to 1,000 times higher than normal. Unfortunately, I have not seen the raw data, but here's the thing. The group that did this study does have pre-fired data for this specific wetland. The group has been studying this area for over 10 years and took soil samples at the same locations before the fire. When compared to the post-fire samples, they found the concentrations jumped significantly, a major increase. The baseline data is important. That's because this wetland has been next to a power plant for years. And with any older power plant, we'd expect to see some level of baseline contamination. Compare this to the Gasworks Park in Seattle, Washington, an old coal gasification plant that was heavily contaminated years after shutting down, and it was eventually declared an EPA Superfund site. That contamination had nothing to do with batteries. It was a result of industrial pollution accumulating over time. And when you look at a list of contaminants like this, you'll see some overlap, but key contaminants we'd expect to see from a battery fire are missing. Back to Moss Landing, in addition to the official testing efforts, a grassroots community group called Never Again Moss Landing took batters into their own hands. They conducted independent environmental sampling to assess potential heavy metal contamination from the Moss Landing battery fire. With the help of over 100 trained volunteers and the guidance from Biomax Environmental, the group collected 124 surface wipe samples around eight days after that fire. These samples were taken from both horizontal and vertical surfaces, like outdoor furniture, solar panels, and the siding of structures, areas that shouldn't normally have significant levels of heavy metals contamination. The testing focused on four key metals known to be released from lithium ion battery fires, lithium, cobalt, manganese, and nickel. Just a side note, I would have loved to see them include copper and aluminum as well. These samples were then analyzed using the NIOSH 9102 standard, which is specifically designed to detect metal contamination in surface dust. I have the raw data from this study, and I've created a map showing where these samples were taken. I've also generated a heat map that visualizes contamination levels, giving us an idea of where the highest concentrations were found. To put this in context, I've also included a map of the initial evacuation and shelter-in-place zones, which will help us understand how the winds may have carried contaminants during the fire. Overall, the health effects of battery fire exposure still aren't well known, and there is a lot of research going on in this area. Just as a disclaimer, as I mentioned before, we don't have any baseline data for this study, and these are values collected at specific sites. The absence of data on this map, it does not mean there isn't contamination. It just means it's an area that wasn't included in the study. The limits I'm about to discuss are occupational limitations, typically for an exposure over an eight-hour workday. The limits for the general public for long-term 24-hour exposure, it's going to be much lower. These types of exposures are really not well studied at this point. Cobalt exposure can cause respiratory issues, skin irritation, and with prolonged exposure may contribute to lung disease. High levels of airborne cobalt can lead to chronic lung inflammation and potential long-term toxicity. For cobalt, the OSHA exposure limit is 100 micrograms per meter cubed, and NIOSH is at 50 micrograms per meter cubed. The EPA is also at 50 micrograms per meter cubed. Based on the data collected, some of these areas are showing as high as 30,000 micrograms per meter squared. But wait a minute, those are completely different units. Stick with me, I'll come back to that. While manganese is essential for people in small amounts, inhalation of high levels can lead to neurological damage, leading to symptoms similar to Parkinson's disease. Chronic exposures linked to cognitive and motor impairments, the manganese OSHA limit is 5,000 micrograms per meter cubed, with NIOSH only at 1,000 micrograms per meter cubed. I wasn't able to find anything for the EPA recommendations. On the map, the highest levels we see are upwards of 35,000 micrograms per meter squared. Again, significantly higher. I'm sure you're starting to see another trend. It's difficult to nail down exactly what level exposure is safe because even the agencies in charge all have different standards. Lithium dust exposure can cause respiratory tract irritation, skin burns, and eye damage. Long-term effects of inhaled lithium compounds are not well studied, but high doses can affect the central nervous system and the kidneys. We really don't have an official safe level for lithium exposure, but some studies suggest that exposure levels above 25 micrograms per cubic meter may cause problems. On the map, you'll see that we have a max level of right around 5,900 micrograms per meter squared. 
Nickel exposure is associated with lung and nasal cancers, respiratory problems, and dermatitis. Chronic exposure can lead to asthma-like symptoms and lung fibrosis. It's also possible that you'll develop a sensitivity to nickel and not be able to touch everyday household items. The OSHA limit is 1,000 micrograms per meter cubed, and NIOSH is only at 15 micrograms per meter cubed. And again, for this one, I wasn't able to find any good data from the EPA. This study on the map, you can see the highest levels are 69,000 micrograms per meter squared. As I mentioned, the units, they don't match. That's because we don't have well-established exposure limits for surface dust. This grassroots study, they measured how much dust settled on a surface, reported in micrograms per square meter. But all occupational exposure limits refer to airborne concentrations, measured in micrograms per cubic meter, which is a measure of volume. Think about a layer of dust sitting on a table. If the wind blows or somebody disturbs it, those particles, they don't stay put. They get kicked up into the air, dispersing into much larger volume. The challenge is we don't have a solid method for understanding how that transition happens or what the hazard is, how much of that settled dust actually becomes airborne, and at what concentration. That's still a big question. I wanted some context for this data, so I reached out to my friends in the research community, and I got reference data from NIOSH. While it's a comparison, it doesn't mean the values below these numbers are necessarily safe, or that the values above them are automatically unsafe. We just don't know at this time. It's an area that really needs more research. Numerous residents in the surrounding area have reported a range of health issues. Headaches, sore throats, metallic taste in their mouth, skin rashes, just to name a few. These symptoms have been reported by residents living up to 30 miles away from the incident site. Many of the affected individuals have sought medical attention, and they are urging the local health departments to investigate the potential health effects of the fire. There is also a ton of agriculture in this area. I'd expect some type of surface contamination to wash off over time with the rainfall, but once it's in the soil, what will be the effect? Will those contaminants end up absorbing into the next batch of crops and make it into our food supply? These are questions that need to be answered. While this study doesn't definitively prove that the contamination came from the fire, it provides strong evidence because something significant was deposited on those surfaces across this wide area. This is exactly the kind of work I'd love to see after any fire incident. Having this information would be invaluable in developing response plans and procedures to keep our community safe. A great example of this is the Morris, Illinois Battery Warehouse fire. I did a video on this a while ago. After that incident, the fire department issued guidance on how to decontaminate properties in the affected area. They also went out and washed down playground equipment so the community could return to normal activities without fear. This fire raises more questions than answers. The data we have so far strongly suggests that contamination was spread across the area, but without baseline measurements, it's difficult to quantify exactly how much of it came from the fire itself. What steps will be taken to ensure long-term monitoring? How will local, state, and federal agencies respond to these findings? And most importantly, will the people who live here, who are dealing with the real health symptoms and real environmental fallout, get the support and the answers they deserve? This isn't just about one fire. It's about what happens when the communities are left to deal with the consequences of emerging technology without proper safeguards in place. Battery storage is only going to expand. And if we don't take incidents like this seriously, it's only a matter of time before we see history repeat itself. So the real question, where do we go from here?